Well, Romans 11 is the unfolding of a mystery. And in biblical terms, a mystery is simply something that was once hidden from humanity, but has now been revealed by God. Now, what is this particular mystery? Well, it is the mystery of God's saving purposes for both the Jew and the Gentile. Paul has been building up to this all the way through Romans 9 to 11. And now, in verse 25, we reach the grand climax. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come, and so all Israel will be saved. So there's the mystery. We have the Jews rejecting the gospel of Christ, hardening themselves, and God has judiciously hardened them. It's his mercy upon us as well as his judgment upon them. We're the beneficiaries. Mercy is extended to us. They are hardened. And yet, although it seems for all the world that this is going to go on forever and that Israel has been abandoned, it is not so. Israel's hardening is not total. Even today, there is a believing Jewish remnant and it's not forever. A day is coming when eyes will be opened and the veil will be lifted and all Israel will be saved. That is the extraordinary mystery that would otherwise be hidden from our perception, but Paul, by the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, reveals to us in this passage. Now, the question is, why? I mean, it's nice to know. Do we need to know why has this mystery been revealed? Well, I'm going to give you two reasons, one negative and one positive. The negative reason is right there in verse 25, so that you may not be conceited. Or in verse 20, do not be arrogant. Paul knew that there were Gentile believers in the church in Rome who believed that God had just done away with the Jews, as it were, uninvented them, and that now that the Gentile church had replaced them. And it was causing a lot of pride and a lot of presumption. And Paul wants them to be under no illusions. If the Jews could fall from such privilege and into the hands of God, well, can that not happen to you? It's a reminder of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 10. And Paul is talking about Old Testament Israel. And he's saying to Christians, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So, Paul says, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So that's the negative. That's the reason Paul reveals this mystery to us, to warn us, to guard us against pride, against repeating the mistakes made in the past. But there's also a positive reason. And I think that's in verse 33. And verse 33 says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. So this mystery has not been revealed to puff us up, but so that we might understand more of God so that we might praise and glorify God I mean after all that's why we were saved why were we saved to be worshippers our minds have been renewed to see the glory of God in Christ and to understand something of his purposes in our world so that we might worship him and it's interesting isn't it in verse 33 to know Something of God's purposes is to realise how much more simply transcends our finite understanding. That we're very small people in the hands of a vast God. And yet, far from causing us to doubt, this is to cause us to praise the greatness of God even more. That's why this mystery has been revealed. Not to puff us up. Not to give us some intellectual understanding. But to guard us against arrogance. To humble us. And to lead us to worship our God. And if, if all you do at the end of this sermon is you go out praising God, well, I'll have done my job. And I hope we will. I really do. Now, last week we considered the first 15 verses of this chapter. And Paul was arguing there that God has not cut off Israel forever. And that the Jews have not fallen beyond any recovery. And Paul was hinting at something special that will happen one day. But... All this begs the first of two questions I'm going to ask to help guide us through this passage. And this first question is quite simply, why? Why Israel? 
What is so special about Israel? And of course, the first answer to that is nothing at all. They are just a bunch of sinners rejecting Christ. They deserve nothing. And yet, in another sense, corporate Israel are special. And once we understand this, it helps to make sense of why God hasn't finished with them. And verse 16, with the help of verse 28, explain this. What does Paul say in verse 16? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Now, there are two parallel metaphors in that verse which make the same point, which is ultimately this. Israel is holy. That's why she's special. Now, before we go any further, we have to think about the word holy. What does it mean? I have a holy sock, but it's because I've got a very big, long toenail. <laughs> so what is holy? Well, it's often used, isn't it, as a kind of shorthand for moral purity. But the Hebrew word for holy basically means to set apart. And of course, it describes God, doesn't it? He is unique. He is other. He lives and he exists completely apart and separate from all other creatures because he's the only uncreated being. All life comes from him. And his character also sets him apart because he's morally pure and perfect, which is why we tend to associate holiness with moral purity. But the essential idea here is separation. God is above and beyond everything and everyone. He is separate. He is holy. So how does such a separate holy God interact with ordinary unholy creatures down here like us? Well, God calls them and he sets them apart for his service. In other words, he calls them holy. Now, God does this with things. Just as an example, in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was holy and sacred. To just touch the Ark was unauthorized. You would die. But it wasn't magic. It was just a wooden box. It was gold-plated. It was ornate. But it was just an inanimate wooden box. It had no innate power, regardless of what Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark might tell you. It was just a box. But it had been set apart and consecrated by God for his use, and therefore it was holy. And in a slightly different way, but a similar way, this is the case with the people of Israel. They weren't morally pure, they weren't genetically superior, and not even every individual within Israel was regenerate. Paul is clear later, most of his countrymen were enemies of the gospel. And yet, corporate Israel had a special identity. They were a people set apart, consecrated by God for blessing and for service. They were to be the vehicle through whom God would bless the whole world. So they were holy. Now, Israel's holiness wasn't innate. It was on account of God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that is what the two illustrations in verse 16 refer to. So we'll take them in turn. In Numbers 15, God gave Israel instructions for when they settled down in the promised land. And they plowed the fields and they reaped the harvest. And when they did this, they were to bring a cake, a portion of the dough from the first fruits of the harvest to the priest. In other words, the first fruits were consecrated they were offered to the Lord. They were set apart for divine use. And Paul says the initial offering consecrated the whole harvest. So by unselfishly offering the first fruits up to the Lord, it had a consecrating effect on the whole harvest. If a small portion of the dough is holy, the whole batch is holy, Paul says. And as a an easier to understand idea in the second illustration, it's the same thing really. If the root is holy, so are the branches. So a good strong root means good strong branches, upheld and nourished by the root. And Paul is telling us that the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are the root. They are the first fruits, holy, set apart by God for God. And verse 20, 28 makes that very clear. In grace, God freely made promises to the patriarchs, which he can't break and he won't break. 
And therefore, on account of the patriarchs, their descendants, corporate Israel, are also considered holy, consecrated to the Lord. And it's not been revoked. Listen to Paul's words in verse 28 and 29. Yes, as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Election refers to God's sovereign choice. Because of his promises to the patriarchs, God set Israel apart for his divine use. He showered them with blessing. Do you remember Romans 9, 4? Theirs is the adoption of sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. These were the great privileges by which God had marked Israel out as special, as holy, apart from other peoples in the world. And he never repented of that. Yes, the majority in Israel have hardened themselves against God. And yes, he has bound them in their rebellion. And those who live and die without Christ will be in hell. And yet Paul is saying that this hardening is temporal. It's not forever. How can it be forever? Can divine promises be revoked? I mean, did God say, well, I've, I've decided I'm going to rescind all that. I've changed my mind. I've given up on the idea of Israel. So just forget all those promises. I, I didn't really know what I was doing. Israel is now dead to me. I'm, I'm working with the church. Now, he could have said that, couldn't he? He'd have been within his rights to say that. And if he was like us, he would have said that. But he never did say that because who is God? Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? So the Lord does not make mistakes. He does not change his mind. He is holy. And he declared that Israel were to be a people consecrated to him and that remains the rebellion of individuals does not change the identity of the corporate people and the very fact of a Jewish remnant is the sign that God isn't done with them yet now I think the reason that we struggle to grasp this is that Israel as we look at them today seem to be far from holy and that was actually true for large parts of Bible history but you see Israel has always been a mixed body. There were always those who truly believed in their hearts, and then there were always those who only had an outward connection with the covenant. In other words, God's Israel, the true Israel, were never meant to be merely a political or ethnic entity. True Israel were heart-changed, believing Jews within the wider whole. That is why Paul said in Romans 2, a man is not a Jew if he's only one outwardly. And circumcision is not merely outward and physical. A man is a Jew if he's one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. And I think it's this distinction between the inward and the outward which will help us answer a second question. Are there two peoples of God? Do we have Israel there and the church there? Two completely separate peoples who both happen to believe in God. And you might think so, by the way some people talk. But I think to help understand this, Paul gives us another illustration in verse 17. And he speaks of the olive tree. One of the most widely cultivated trees in the ancient Middle East. A beautiful tree, a fruitful tree. Also used symbolically in the Old Testament. And here, Paul uses this to speak of the people we've just been talking about, Israel, called by God, set apart by God, belonging to God. This is very much a tree with a Jewish root. And that root is the covenant promises given to the patriarchs. From the entire population of planet Earth, God chose to focus his promises on one man, Abraham, and his descendants the people of Israel. And that is why for nearly 2,000 years, the people that grew from this tree were mainly physical blood descendants of Abraham. They are, if you like, the natural branches. But God's promises could only ever be received by faith, not by sight. 
and the branches that would grow and flourish on this tree would only be Jews truly connected to the root. For this tree is inner Israel, made up of those who shared the faith of Abraham, who believed the promises, who trusted in God and not in themselves. Because you see, God always had a grander vision. It went far beyond natural bloodline. This tree wasn't to be merely a a, a political entity, a nation with borders. The promises to the patriarchs always had an ultimate significance for the whole of mankind. As God told Abraham, do you remember in Genesis 12, through him, through your descendants, I'm going to bless the entire world. God's Israel were always going to be a light to the nations. And out of Israel would arise the Messiah, come to die for the sins of the world. That's why, even in the Old Testament, there were people like Rahab, people like Naaman, non-Jews from outside the covenant, drawn in by Israel's light. If you like, they were wild branches, unnatural branches, unrelated to Abraham, yet they shared his faith. And so God grafted them into that tree. And it was a, a little foreshadowing of the gospel age where this situation has flipped on its head. This Jewish tree, with mainly Jewish branches, is now a Jewish tree with many, many more unnatural branches. Gentiles grafted on. Because you see today, and I think it was mentioned in our prayer, is the gospel day. This is the time of fulfillment. Abraham's great descendant, Jesus Christ, the Jew, he's come. The law, the privilege that marked off Israel from all the other nations, it's been fulfilled by Christ's perfect life. And all those old sacrifices that, uh, about, that uh, they had to do, they merely anticipated the once for all sacrifice for sin that Christ has now made. For the sins of all people, not just Jews. And this means something quite significant. Ephesians 2 talks of Christ. He himself is our peace. He's made the two one. He's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, his purpose to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. So in this day, in the light of Calvary, the gospel day, Christ's work finished, there is no exclusivity. Paul says in Galatians 3, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Faith rests in Christ's work, and it always has done. No, Abraham didn't see it clearly, but he looked to the Messiah to come. So did all the Old Testament saints, even the ones that lived before Abraham. And now Christ has come, the fulfillment of the ages. And in trusting in him, you and I are brought into God's people of faith. We're non-Jews. We're wild olive shoots. We've got no right to be part of this tree and yet by the grace of God and the death of Christ, through faith, we are grafted in to the olive tree. We're welcomed in to Israel. And this is a little part of the mystery that Paul is unfolding here in Romans 11. The extraordinary expanse of God's mercy. It's so great that in Revelation 7 it speaks of a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people and language. And yet the sad irony is that while the Jewish tree of faith grows ever more fruitful and many, many, many Gentiles are being grafted on, many of Abraham's physical descendants are perishing. They're ethnically Jewish. They're outwardly connected to Israel. Indeed, they claim to be Israel, but they're not connected to the root. They lack Abraham's faith. They don't believe in the promises. They won't accept God's son. And therefore, God has, if you like, hewn those natural branches off. And though they remain outward Jews, they're not inward Jews. They're not connected and attached to God's olive tree. And here is the answer to the question. 
Are there two peoples of God? And the answer is categorically no. There is only one people, the Israel of faith. And faith is the distinctive. Just as there is only one tree and one people elected according to God's grace, it's faith, isn't it? Faith in the promises of God, that's the unifying factor. Jews today reject the promises given to Abraham. Therefore, they're not a separate, independent people of God. As things stand, right now, as I stand here, they're perishing. It's a tragedy of the highest proportions that ethnic Israel have been cut off from their own olive tree. Ethnic Israel cut off from true Israel, which is awful. It's really awful, and God is going to do something about it. But before we consider that, Paul wants to speak to us. He says back in verse 13, I am talking to you Gentiles, so that includes everyone here. See, Paul is concerned that we could get a bit proud. That's the subject of verses 18 to 24. You see, the church in Rome reflected the wider situation of the gospel age. The Gentiles were in the ascendancy. Jewish believers were in the minority. And it seems that some gentle, Gentile believers, they may have been gentle as well, um, were misunderstanding God's salvation plan. They thought that God had just given up on the Jews, that the church had replaced Israel, and, and therefore any Jew who now wished to join their church community had to do so on their terms. And some of these believers were even boasting, well, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted on, and Paul says, well, actually, yeah, you are correct. That is true, but don't boast about it. You're not special. Don't misunderstand what God's doing. What is the chain that links us with Abraham and the patriarchs? Faith. And that's not innate to us, is it? Faith is God's gracious gift to us. No Gentile has earned the right to be part of God's people. I have no right in calling myself an Israelite of the heart and being part of the olive tree. But by God's grace, that's what I am. There's no cause for pride, is there? If you know your heart, you'll know this. We must not look at ethnic Israel today and sneer. Yes, they fell because of pride and unbelief. But those things aren't exclusively Jewish, are they? They're just what it means to be human. We all struggle with them. And you know... There are parallels, because in the church today, there are many card-carrying outward members of the covenant community who profess but don't possess. People in the church who look the part and they do lots of stuff within the church, but there's no true inner reality, and yet they're proud and they're superior and they believe they're secure even though they aren't. And their self-delusion is frightening. And that is why, in verse 20, Paul gives us the antidote to that kind of attitude, the antidote to pride. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. Now, Paul is speaking about a fear that, first of all, looks within. It's an anxiety, if you like. It's a self-suspicion that, but for the grace of God, I would fall. And there's a lot within me that could cause me to fall. And I'm fearful of that. But secondly, this is a fear that then looks upwards. It's a reverent fear that is in awe of God. What does Paul say in verse 22? Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. You see, God is both stern and kind. Now, if God was only stern and never kind, well, he'd be a hard, exacting taskmaster, full of justice, without mercy. He'd be a God impossible for us to know. But if God was kind but never stern, well, his kindness would be unjust. He would be a soft kind of a God who just sort of turned a blind eye to evil, and we wouldn't want to know such a God as that. And God is perfect in his attributes, perfectly balanced. He is stern and he's kind. He is just and he's merciful. He is both just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. There are never any violations of justice, for there are only two options. 
Either a person's sin is paid for by Jesus on the cross or they pay for it themselves in hell. But either way, divine justice is always done. Sin is always atoned for one way or the other. And yet how awesome that there is a way for it to be atoned and it doesn't involve me. Isn't it amazing that this just God is so kind, that mercy is so available, that those who are born into sin can be ransomed, healed, restored and forgiven. And that's where Paul wants us to be today. He doesn't want us to be conceited or superior. He wants us to be humbled by God's grace in reverent awe of his kindness, dependent upon him, looking to him, trusting him, suspicious of self, resting in his grace. But in the meantime, what of outward Israel? What about the stiff-necked physical descendants of Abraham? What of them? Well, we're going to reach the climax now of the mystery that Paul is unfolding. That Israelite unbelief is not decisive because God's grace is what's decisive. God can soften their hard hearts and he can bring them back into the fold. Verse 23, if they do not persist in unbelief, they'll be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, as he often does, Paul uses a very familiar how much more argument. So God has done this monumental thing. Contrary to nature, he's grafted Gentiles, non-Jews, wild olive shoots onto this cultivated olive tree. And if he's done that, then he can surely regraft the original branches back on, those natural Jewish branches. And in fact, this is precisely what God is going to do. This is the ultimate measure of God's kindness, that the sin of many individual Jews has not nullified his commitment to the whole. God has not forgotten the Jewish root. He still loves Abraham's children. He remembers the promises that he made to them. And therefore, verse 25, Israel has experienced a hardening. We've talked about this in the past. And it's they've hardened their hearts, but God has also hardened them. And it's happened in part, not in full. There is a Jewish remnant, but it's happened until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Now, some people suggest that all Israel in verse 26 basically refers to the church or to the community of the elect to save Jews and Gentiles. But there's a problem with that. You see, Paul has used the term Israel 10 times in Romans 9 to 11. And each time it very clearly refers to ethnic Israel. And it, I think it would make a nonsense of that context to suggest that Paul is suddenly abruptly changing the meaning of Israel because, of course, these three chapters concern Paul's heartache for his countrymen, for ethnic Jews. And, of course, I think it would make verse 26 a statement of the blindingly obvious. All God's elect will be saved. Well, if they're elect, of course they will be. It doesn't really need to be said. And yet Paul is saying something significant that does need to be said. Ethnic Israel is perishing. The Jews are cut off from their own olive tree. They've hardened themselves, and God has hardened them, but he's done it for a purpose, so that he can bring many Gentiles into the assembly of faith. But when the full number of Gentiles has been saved, at a time known only to God, then there's something more. More than merely a remnant of Jews, all ethnic Israel will be saved. Now, all clearly doesn't mean all Jews without exception who've ever lived. I don't think God is going to retrospectively save those who died in unbelief. Judas Iscariot, King Saul, King Ahab, Korah, I don't think he's, he's going to go back and save those people. They were outward Jews, but they didn't have circumcised hearts. They died in unbelief and they're in hell. And all doesn't necessarily even mean every single ethnic Israelite living in the world 
at the time. If you look into the Old Testament, you'll see examples of how all is used to speak of the vast majority, not necessarily strictly every, every last Israelite man, woman, child. So all, we don't know exactly. It may mean all, it may not, but whatever the, the number, it must at least mean very many, far more than the current remnant. The vast majority, I hope it does mean every last man, woman and child who is a Jew. We don't know. And we don't want to move away from what Paul is saying here and speculate. But what I should say is that Paul isn't speculating himself. He's not making this up. He quotes from Isaiah 59 and Isaiah 27 to give us a composite quote to back up what he's saying. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, interestingly, Paul's quote is slightly different from the original. Isaiah said, the deliverer will come to Zion. That's a reference to Christ's first coming. And it was very much in keeping with Jewish expectation of a Messiah who would come to Jerusalem. Isaiah, 700 years before Christ, saw a future salvation for Israel. After a lot of judgment and a lot of dark times, Isaiah saw light at the end of the tunnel. But Paul, of course, is speaking after Christ's first coming. He already knows that Christ has come and gone back to heaven. He's now in heaven. He's in Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. And yet Paul sees in Isaiah's prophecy a greater fulfillment, that after a lot of dark times, after God's judgment, after many Jews have lived and died in unbelief, Paul sees a light at the end of the tunnel, that Christ will come and visit salvation upon Israel when he comes again. For he is coming again. He's coming from Zion to this world to bring judgment upon the world, and yet amazingly, he also comes to bring salvation for Israel. And just as it was the first time, so the second time. We're not talking about a political salvation. We're not talking about land or borders. We're talking about something far more important. We're talking about the salvation of souls. Christ will come to turn away godlessness and pride and unbelief and to save souls, Jewish souls. Now, when's it going to happen? Will Jewish eyes be opened literally the moment that Christ appears in the sky? Or will it happen sometime before? Again, we don't know. We can't speculate. It must be quite close to the end. We can say that. But I think what is clear is this. That salvation will come to all Israel the same way it's always come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. The one they pierced is the one they will trust in by faith and by faith alone. There are now not two ways to get to heaven. There is no salvation other than by faith in the deliverer, in God's son who died for sinners. And there's something else we can say as well. That Israel are not saved so that they can sort of exist in a separate part of heaven, away from the Gentiles. No, they are being grafted back into their own tree, the Jewish olive tree of both Jew and Gentile, precisely as God always intended. And in that glorious day, there isn't going to be any confusion. Nobody's going to ask, well, are there two peoples of God? Because the outward and the inward will be united. Now, I'm going to ask a question I asked at the very beginning. Why? Why is God going to do this? But I think the answer is now clearer. Now we've got to the end. And the answer is divine mercy. That's what all this is about. If you look at verses 30 to 31, Paul keeps talking about disobedience and mercy. And that is the long and short of it. That the Gentiles were disobedient for so long, and yet God showed them mercy. And now the Jews are disobedient. And God's going to show them mercy true too. There's a symmetry to it. We could even say that although people, Jew and Gentile, are always responsible for their sins, God, in his mysterious providence, allows them to sin so that he might show the greatness of his mercy. Now, try and wrap your mind around that. 
It's mysterious, isn't it? And I don't really understand exactly how all this works. It's one of the most difficult passages I think I've ever preached on. But I think the question is, why should I fully understand all these things? And why should you? Paul says, who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? That's what God asked Old Testament Job. Job was going through unbelievable suffering and he was demanding answers of God and we would have done as well. And God says, well, who are you? Who are you to ask me? You don't know what you're talking about. Were you there when I created the universe? And of course, Job couldn't answer. All he could do was humble himself. And that's our calling, isn't it, today? Who are we to gainsay God or second guess what he does The point of these verses is not to puff us up with knowledge and it's not to get us all debating and arguing and dividing over secondary issues. Nothing like that. These verses are here so that we might see the glory of God. This stern God of justice who is yet so kind and shows such mercy. And so we can, I think, echo Paul. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his past beyond tracing out. He's the God of our salvation. He will save all Israel too. Praise his name. Amen.